Welcome to Meet the Leader, and we are delighted to have with us Her Excellency Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, the former president of Liberia. Thank you so much for making time to be with us. It's a pleasure to talk to you. As we delve into leadership and try to understand better uh, the issues around leadership in Africa, um, take us through who Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is. Take us a little bit through your childhood, but also the things that you believe define you. Well, I grew up in a very strong Christian home. My mother was a, a pastor and a teacher. My father, of course, was in politics. Um, we grew up knowing that we had to do chores, uh, that we, we had to ensure that we went to school and were diligent in our studies and our homework. Uh, we had to respect elders, our parents included, of course. Um, I believe my mother had the greatest influence on me and my siblings. I was the third child of four, uh, a sister, two brothers because she instilled in us what we all grew up to, to call the three H's. Mm -hmm. Hard work, honesty, humility. And I think those shaped much of what became my own character. My father, being the first indigenous a uh, member to be elected to the legislature, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. imbued in us a sense of our roots. Because you see, I came from a family that I said had feet in both worlds. My father was fully indigenous from the Global uh, Kola tribe. Mm -hmm. And he taught us when I said to respect our roots. He taught us to go back to the village right. every time school closed to appreciate village life from whence he came. Um, of course, as someone who lived in the city, both he and my mother grew up uh, in other people's homes, mm -hmm. which was the pattern in Liberia. Your parents are poor. My mother was half indigenous uh, from Sino County, but if you see our complexion, it's because her father was a German trader in Liberia mm -hmm. who left the country, you know, after she was born because of problems with Germany and the World War. It was time, the, it was time for the World War I. Right. And oh. so all the Germans were expelled. Uh, so I did, I never knew him. Uh, but again, she too, because of their, their roots and because of the fact that they were advantaged by living in settlers' homes to be able to get an education. Mm -hmm. They shaped our appreciation for education. And they shaped our appreciation for, for being also to realize where we came from. Uh, and I think that has enabled me in my own political life to be able to go to any village, any settlement, any county, and make sure the people know their way of like talk like them. Connect to connect, connect to, to them. understand them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and that has been part I think of you know what has built up my my leadership in such a way that um, that I relate to people at all levels. Yes, I'm educated, I can sit, you know, some of the highest arena and and talk and interact and but you can and be sit a in part, the village, but I can also sit in the village and feel very comfortable. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my life story. Maybe another thing is that my father got ill during the process. And, and so he got ill and for seven years he had a stroke. My mother had to take care of us. So I learned to be prosperous when he was in the legislature and he lived a good life. I also learned to be poor. 
when he got ill and she had to take care of us, she had to do things that people mm -hmm. did, like selling bread and all those things. So I come from both worlds, and so it's, it's easy for me to have a different outlook in how I approach things and how I deal with issues and whatnot. Like and that's so important. I want to just focus a little bit on that story. And as you mentioned, your father being the first indigenous legislator elected into office, coming from a background where you understood the village, you understood the urban setting, you understood poverty, but you also understood wealth. Then the challenge of leadership comes at a time when it's difficult to step up. Sometimes it's easier, and I think a lot of people maybe do not listen to the call of leadership. Why did you, why did you pay attention to that call, and what was it that made you go into this world? Well, let's put it that um, the quest, the success of leadership, was an evolving process. It's not something that I started and determined that I'm going to be a leader, or I'm going to seek to be the president. No. The evolution came in taking positions consistent with the principles with which I grew up. So I could stand up in the classroom and say, no, I don't see it this way. Mm -hmm. I look at it differently. Uh, that stands out and maybe that starts you taking, being regarded as someone you know, that leads the way mm -hmm. in terms of taking position. And so my leadership thing is to lead by, by example, to lead by courage you know, in the conviction that you have. So if I send it uh, to the pinnacle, it's because I took one step at a time. I did not catapult into the highest level of this land. I grew up with it step by step. So powerful. Leadership is a collection of things. It's habit, it's behavior. It's not an event that occurs. Absolutely. Powerful. You are the first elected woman head of state in Africa, the first woman chair of ECOWAS uh, as well. Let's take a look at these milestones for Liberia, but in a wider context for Africa as well. This meant a lot. Um, what do you think it, it really represents for the people of Africa that we were able to, to do this? Clearly setting an example of how what seems to be the impossible can be possible. Right. Breaking the glass ceiling, open the doors, not only for women who are responding quite well to this example, but to young girls. Today, the young girls are more educated than many were in our, in our generation. Rural women, mm -hmm who did not feel they would ever have the opportunity to be a participant in the affairs of society, do so today. They are being empowered. They're being empowered, they're right. participating, they speak out. And so I believe that um, being the president of Liberia, I, I go around and I, I tell you, the inspiration that this has made for young girls in Africa, beyond Africa, uh, that reach out and want to know, you know, I want now to be president. So many here right. can now stand right. up and say, I want to be president. You know, that ambition is already embedded in them because now they know that it is possible. Someone led the way. What patterns yeah. do you see? unfolding? Are we, though, as Africa moving forward or, uh, or backward in this regard with respect to women's leadership? I still believe we're moving forward. If I look at the many women today that are holding leadership positions, there's some countries, of course, that lag behind. But generally speaking, more women are participating in every aspect of society's life. More women are claiming leadership, and in those cases, being able to not only claim it, but to live it, 
and to set the example for others, there may be some backsliding. Like I keep saying, you know, there's a void now. There's only, there was only one democratic elected woman president. Mm -hmm. No longer there. The void is there. But believe me, when that void is filled, it's going to be filled with multiples. We are hopeful. <laughs> we are hopeful. hopeful. We're not only hopeful, yes. we have to work for it. There we go. <laughs> we must, as women, be able to see this in the long-term context and begin with the strategy and the tactics to be able to achieve that goal. And I believe that's going to happen. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah. What for you is good leadership? What are the characteristics of a good leader? Setting the example by the way you live, what you say, what you do. Setting the example that inspire others to be able to follow you. Ensuring that there's teamwork, realizing that you cannot do it alone. Others have a role to play, mm -hmm. and those others must believe in you and work with you toward the achievement of shared values or common goals. Being bold and courageous, sometimes right. to take hard decisions that may affect you or affect the society or the group with we, but if you stand by the conviction that you are right in the position you are taking, uh, then you have to be prepared, even when sometimes there may be consequences right. that you would have to bear. And that is the burden of leadership. That's correct. Looking at Africa now, um, what would your thoughts be on, on our strengths and weaknesses in terms of leadership? And are women leaders particularly different from men leaders? Is, is that something important or is it just an individual thing? What Africa and, and, and the gender issue around leadership, please, your thoughts on those two. Most of those who are sent to high office are leaders who are women, not women who are leaders. There's a difference. That is powerful. They are leaders who are women. women. Because they possess qualities that are equal to or superior to men. Otherwise, they would not be able to lead in a manner in which their leadership inspires and accepts it. That means the same qualification, competence, Boldness. Demeanor. Yes, yes. Uh, now, because they are women, that's where the difference comes in. Women tend to be more sensitive mm. to human needs. That's why women don't go to war. Maybe because of mothers. Uh, maybe that love for for children, for human beings. It's all part of the psyche, part of their character. So they tend to find compromising ways to resolve problems rather than to go aggressive. Conflict, okay. they avoid the, <laughs> yes, the battle calls. Yes. That's not to say that if it's called for to go to battle because you're standing by something that you truly believe in and know it right, then you have to be strong enough to do it. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, women will stop and think, how will this affect the children? Mm -hmm. How will this affect people? How will this affect people in the villages before they act? When you look at Africa, what do we need from our leaders? What's the one characteristic that we need more of? Humility. There's too much pomposity in leaders who, you know, the pomp and pageantry mm. of awful high office gets to people and sometimes then they distance themselves from the people who voted for them, from the people whom they are leading. From the people from who the matter. People, for the people who they must set the example for. 
you know, we get too caught up in the, in the niceties and the prosperity and the something of high office, and we sometimes forget. I think but there are some leaders that do have the humility required, you know, quite a few. Okay. But um, we're speaking generally, yes, so I say yes. generally. Uh, it happens, and this is why sometimes you find somebody who, who maybe comes up with a, you know, come from an environment that is lowly, normal, common, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden gets into high office. And then you, you see a total change. A corruption. Because, the, right. because power corrupts. Right. We, we all know that. That's a common saying, power corrupts, and it does. And unless someone is very steady and very strong in their convictions and their habits and have grown up in that way. Uh, it's very difficult to resist the allure. Absolutely. And humility also indicates service. Yes. A perspective that we are here to serve. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's missing okay. in, uh, in some leaders that really uh, you're not there to rule. You're there to lead and to serve. Right. Yeah. I think those, those are the, the things that sometimes are forgotten. Is the continent progressing? Our continent is progressing. You yes. know, uh, I'm rabbit in optimism. <laughs> Good. <laughs> for the continent. Great. Uh, because I think it is progressing by every measurement. Uh, I keep saying that there are always some laggards. There are always people who fall behind mm -hmm. for one reason or another, domestic or external. But generally, the continent is moving in the right direction. Uh, democracy has taken hold, and you can see it spreading. Today, unlike days of the past, where we were caught up in militarism and dictatorship, uh, today, the peaceful transfer of power is becoming, you know, abound in most of Africa. And so what we do need is to ensure that our economies perform better. Some are, no doubt, but the deficiencies in infrastructure and capacity have left us behind. Mm. All the effort now is how do we fill, how do we cover that gap? Uh, and once that happens, where we move from being the producers and suppliers of primary commodities to value addition in manufacturers and industries, and many of our countries are moving in that direction and moving it quite rapidly. But once we get the majority moving in that direction, where we can compete with any other region in the world, then I think Africa would have arrived. But we're, we're on the way. We're getting there. We're getting, we're getting there. there. Let's talk about um, peace and security for, for a little bit and the safety of women, the right for women to participate in peace building, the focus on peace building. This has been a cause that you've been particularly passionate about. And um, in 2011, uh, alongside uh, Lema uh, Bowie, and I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, I hope That's I correct. do, Bowie. <laughs> And uh, Tawakol, Carmen, you received the Nobel Peace Prize. This is an incredible thing. Talk us through your work in this area. Why was it so important to you? And, and what does it mean for you, for Africa to continue um, its efforts at peace and stability? Well, let me first say that, um, as I've said over and over, I accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the women of Liberia, because the peace building efforts were theirs. Yes, as a leader who encouraged, uh, as one who worked closely with them and had a relationship with them, mm -hmm. um, they could be bold in doing what they did. Liman Bowie worked very closely with them at the ground level to, to be able to to fight the dictatorship and the, that, that our country was going through, the conflict, mm -hmm. you know, that had beset us for almost two decades. Um, but today, what women have done in Liberia and all over, I mean, 
is to take demand of place at the table. That place was always vacant because while women may have been out there trying to resolve conflicts, trying to negotiate peace settlements, when the time came around the table to be able to organize the leadership group, or they were not there. It's happening. We saw it in Liberia. Mm. They were missing for a long time, but toward the end, there were a few of them. Uh, small numbers, but it's been established, the role they play mm. and the role they continue to play in society right now that helps to continue to empower women to take positions, to be at the table in any setting, promoting peace or promoting society's endeavor. Women at the table is critical. What more can we do in Africa to ensure that we are changing some of the realities that we have mm -hmm. around the questions of peace and security? We need more communication, better communication. Uh, I must say in this respect that our media uh, needs to be more informed, um, need to do more to tell the narrative, the true narrative of Africa, mm -hmm. where it stands, what it's doing, not to be outdone by the external that's looking for the sensational, the traumatic, you know, you know, story that gets to be that puts Africa in this bad light. Our media must be more communications trained, attuned, aggressive, in and sensitive to some of the issues on the ground. And this is without being able to undermine the independence that we know they must have. But that independence and that freedom to be independent must carry with a certain responsibility to ensure that they promote that which is required for their own long-term prosperity. A lot of work to be done there, it seems. I think so. Let's come now to um, the key things maybe you've learned. We're coming towards the end of the interview. It's been an interesting leadership journey for you, a challenging one, a rewarding one as well. What for you are the key insights? What have you learned? What would you share with us as some of the most exciting or enlightening things for you? I've learned that intelligence is not education. So many people who haven't had the kind of formal education that we all have have been privileged to have, have much more insights as to what can work in a society, what are the requirements for advancement, for peace. And we must recognize that. Um, very interesting you say that recently in a Stanford setting, we actually highlighted the fact that cultural education is very important. And, and this focus on maybe the, the, the modern education system at the expense of some of the other knowledge we have is, is a problem that Africa needs to deal with. How, what would you advise um, you know, leaders in terms of being aware of the realities of, of the rewards and the importance of our cultural knowledge or some of our social knowledge? To be a part of it, to understand it, mm -hmm. to know it, to read about it, mm -hmm. to practice it, to encourage it. You know, Clear, a clear example, I, 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 when, when we face that deadly disease, Ebola in this country, and all the predictions you told about millions of people dying, and our first reaction was to have a military report of restraining the movement of people. Um, and in the end, one of the things I had to do was to take a decision for cremation, something our country had never known mm. uh, any advice from the, you know, my peers. I can't do it. We are a Christian nation. We don't do that. We don't do that. We have to have the means to go and see our our fallen, our dead person, and take flowers to them, and mm -hmm. go and 
you know, but it took a little bit of people, not educated people, to say in our way, Ma, we got to do it. We got to do it. We got to do it. And we did. And congratulations. And we saved thousands yes. of lives. Yes. By congratulations doing that. for coming out of that astounding country. Um, a frightening time. With all this knowledge behind you, with all this experience, what are you doing now that you love? Tell us about what next for Ellen Johnson, Surly. <laughs> I, I've been going through some of my books. I have an archivist to come and get the papers together, get the books together, get all the medals and all the things gathered over these 12 years. So what do I do with it? There's a story to be told. And so I'm now putting together a center for women in development mm -hmm. where my life story can be an example to inspire, to support, to promote women who aspire to leadership. Um, I walk them through the expectations and the aspirations of women that I have had to champion. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it all. I'm not perfect. I made a lot of mistakes. But those mistakes are part of my life story. Mistakes that they, in their life story, will benefit from and correct. Right. Right. And so I'm looking forward to sharing that story with young girls, with women in Africa, beyond Africa. That's amazing. Uh, so we're trying to work on that. That's Got a amazing. few friends working with me on that. That's amazing. I love that. There's a story to be told. And ladies and gentlemen, a center for women in this space is coming up to learn, to grow, to support. I heard a wonderful story you told once about a little boy who you met. And you asked him, maybe you tell us that story. <laughs> Do you remember that one? Please share that story. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's a school with you know, young toddlers and whatnot. Uh, and so we went and just asked a little boy, say, you know, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? A little eight-year-old uh, child. And he said, oh, I think I, will, I want to be vice president. I said, but come on. The president is the highest office in the land. You want to be president? Oh, no, that's a woman's job. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I was inspired when I heard that story. I was delighted, and it shows the difference that when one person blazes a trail, it makes such a change. As we close the interview, please speak to aspiring leaders across Africa. What words of wisdom, knowledge, would you share with them? Well, I can say to leaders of Africa, we hold in our hands the key to the success, the development, the progress of millions of our citizens in all of our country. When we speak, we influence how they speak. When we take a position they follow that position because they see us as leaders, which is what we are. When we act, they too look at that action and believe in it, and they follow it. If we do the wrong things, and you know we, we do, integrity issues, habits that do not show aspiring leadership, when we do those, it's picked up by our millions of citizens around. And sometimes the environment haven't taken this, even from previous leaders, 
we, new leaders that come in, sometimes to battle uh, some of those systemic cultural habits that have been embedded in the citizens, face a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. That's why all leaders must try to do the right thing, to set the right example, so that we build in the culture and value system of our people that which enables them to become good, honest, hardworking citizens, promoting their own development, the development of their environment, the development of their country and their continent. Ellen Johnson, Sir Leaf, it's been an absolute honor. Thank you so much. Do the right thing, set the right example. Thank you very much. <laughs>